Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in our 2016 webinar series on the topic of revolutionizing humanitarian aid through local making. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'm the Director of Programs here at Engineering for Change. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. So, I'd like to take a moment to tell you a bit more about our webinar today. Following a disaster, getting urgent supplies to those that need them is exceptionally challenging. Approximately 60 to 80 percent of all aid income is spent overcoming complex logistical challenges, such as lengthy transport distances, difficult terrain, and unusual import restrictions. Consequently, in remote, difficult to access locations, obtaining replacement parts for vital equipment or systems often becomes impossible due to a lack of availability or prohibitive cost. Local manufacture has the potential to become a viable alternative to traditional procurement methods, especially where supplies are difficult or expensive to obtain. In the recovery from the Nepal earthquake, the organization FieldReady has been leveraging local manufacture extensively. So we've invited Abby Bush, technical advisor for the Nepal uh, chapter of FieldReady, and Naomi Lundman, Curator of Humanitarian Makers, to share their insights on how local manufacture can enable preparedness, capacity building, and positive economic impact. I'd like to welcome both of you today and thank you for joining us. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to thank the E4C webinar series team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the team via the email address visible on the slide. The webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. Information on upcoming installments in this series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on our webinars page, as the URL is listed. And if you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join our conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. All right, so before we get moving to our presenters, <clears throat> I'd like to tell you a bit more about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge exchange platform and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities, which can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. And we invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. Membership provides cost-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resources, opportunities such as jobs and fellowships, and a growing database of hundreds of poverty alleviating products in our solutions library. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to join our passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better around the world. Check out our website to learn more and sign up. Now, E4C has an upcoming webinar, including a segment with our special mobile data collection series with the Development Impact Lab by UC Berkeley, where we're introducing a sample of six survey software tools with a demo on how to implement each tool. On April 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard, we'll feature Premise, a data and analytics platform measuring global economic and human development trends in real time. Check out the E4C professional development page for registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. I'd love to see where everyone is from today. So in the chat window, which is located to the bottom right of your screen, please type your location. And I'll start. And please be sure that it's the chat window, not the Q&A window. Um, and if you don't see the chat window, just access it by clicking the chat icon on the top right-hand corner of the screen. So we have a lot of folks from New York today representing. Um, any technical questions or administrative problems should go into the chat window. And you can also feel free to send a private chat to uh, Engineering for Change admin if you have any issues. So welcome from all of the states in Kathmandu, uh, right? Uh, you can also use the chat window to type any remarks you may have. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenter. 
Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon on the top right-hand corner. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try saying stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up a WebEx in a different browser. So I'm seeing all the, all the fantastic folks we have on today joining us and sharing where they're from. We have everyone from all over the states, Chicago, Florida, Ohio. We also have folks from Kyoto, Canada, Calgary we have here, Milwaukee, San Fran. Amazing. Thank you, everyone, for joining us from all over the world. We really appreciate it. All right. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour, PDH, for this session, please follow the instructions at the top of the E4C professional development page, and the URL is listed on the slide. All right. Now that you're all comfortable with the chat, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Abby Bush, who is a technical advisor for Field Ready, uh, which is a startup seeking to revolutionize the delivery through local manufacturing. She's currently heading Field Ready's operations in Nepal and is working through numerous partnerships with NGOs, makerspaces, and industrial scale manufacturers to investigate how local manufacturing can best benefit the earthquake response. Her background is in manufacturing engineering um, from Cambridge University. And she enjoys life's, life's best when working on projects for innovation within the aid and development sectors. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Abby and give you a warm welcome. Hi, Ayona. Thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be invited to be up to contribute to the E4C webinar series today. As I know, we have a tight schedule. I guess uh, I'm going to jump right in. And actually, I have to start today's webinar with a bit of a confession. An embarrassing secret, if you will. I'm an engineer, a manufacturing engineer, in fact, trying to discuss how and when to make things when supply chains fail. But I have a bit of an awkward history when it comes to making. Let me give you an example. A while back, when I was living in the UK, my blender broke. I gamely took it apart to see what was wrong and realized the rubber seal between the jug and the base had perished and split. There were quite a few options open to me at the time to remedy the situation. I got as far as Googling whether I could quickly obtain a replacement seal from Amazon, but when after 10 minutes I couldn't find one, I instead selected a nice new blender off Amazon for 20 quid. I'll even admit to you I have an Amazon Prime account, so the new blender arrived next day, which is pretty awesome. There's supply chain efficiency for you. And my old blender ended up on its way to the skip. Looking back at this, I must admit I feel a little ashamed of my attitude. As I'm sure many of you could tell me, there must have been about 100 different options open to me to invent a solution to the problem. And as someone who does enjoy making things, I feel I should have been a little more resourceful. At the time, however, I felt rather impatient about the whole thing, like there were better things for me to be doing with my time. And I guess for me it came down to time and effort versus cost. 20 quid for five minutes on Amazon and my blender arrives the next day. Or, you know, maybe I could make my own seal. Half an hour on my bike in the rain to go and get a five pound sheet of gasket, half an hour back, another hour measuring the relevant dimensions and cutting it to shape, then testing it and discovering, say, that the gasket I bought is actually a fraction too thick and the jug won't screw into the base. Essentially, my excuses boil down to my time is valuable, and it's better use of my time to just buy a new one. And also, I kind of had the notion that blender designers are some sort of secret geniuses of blender seal technology, and hence my solution would never, would never be as good. What's more, I don't think I'm the only one with this mindset. My partner, for example, another engineer, in fact, did the same thing with our lawnmower. A bit of digging could potentially have yielded a good solution, but it was deemed better to use, better, better use of money and time to simply buy a relate replacement that could be delivered straight to the door. And again, there was the notion that lawnmower designers must know something special, we didn't. Another place where there are many engineers with this mindset is in humanitarian aid. However, here, the consequences are a little different. This is a picture of an IDP camp. You can see there is a value in the picture, on the far side, there is a town, and on the other side, a collection of temporary shelters that have been set up to accommodate people from the region who have been forced out of their homes. A key part of the camp is the water supply. 
Often a gravity feed water system will be set up using a tank to store water from a nearby water source, say a spring. Then pipes are run from the tank down the hill to different areas of the camp where inhabitants can access the water at a number of taps. I recently had a conversation with a wash manager who was overseeing the work of a number of engineers in setting up a water system in an emergency context. He explained to me that when he arrived at the camp, he discovered the water distribution system was only partially complete. On further investigation, he found out that this was due to the fact that the kit of water fittings supplied was insufficient and they had run out of tea fittings. The engineer, similar to me, had thought about the value of his time and had concluded the best thing to do was to order a new set of water fittings, then set to work on other problems. Unfortunately, during the two weeks it took these fittings to arrive, a significant proportion There is a big part of me, and I'm sure a big part of you, that agrees with the engineer's decision-making process. Setting up an emergency camp is a highly time-pressured situation. You have to prioritize your time, and taking half an hour to order new fittings seems a much more effective use of time than spending five hours scrapping around for a novel solution. So we end up here again. Unless the solution is obvious and immediately to hand, it's pretty tough to commit time to solving a problem where you're not really certain how much time it will take to reach a solution, or even if you ever will find a solution. So let's look at a different scenario, where there were solutions readily to hand, and we see how events unfolded. So this is another IDP camp, this time in Nepal, Nepal where I'm currently working. Uh, set up in the aftermath of the earthquake last April. Just for clarity, I should add that the names on the tanks pictured here provided the equipment but were not actually the entities responsible for the camp. Don't want to get into trouble. Um, the situation here in Nepal is slightly different to the previous context. The INGOs are working through local NGOs who are used to working with the materials available in Nepal. Additionally, there are some of the items available on the local market. Not a wide range, but some. Again, when the NGO was constructing this water distribution system, they found that they did not have the right fittings. Actually, they didn't have any. Um, so instead, they were resourceful. They bought up GI fittings, uh, which stands for galvanized iron fittings from the local markets, and used these instead. When they didn't have enough of these, they pushed smaller diameter pipe between the larger pipes to form a joint which is great. And instead of waiting weeks for the correct parts, these guys had resourcefully, resourcefully found a way to get the system up and running. Local making has saved the day. However, I guess now is the point where I must stick a spanner in the works and ask the question, was this really an appropriate solution? Let's stop for a second, have a closer look at uh, these workarounds. So I guess a diagram like this should look familiar from your engineering lectures way, way back years ago. Um, so I wanted to highlight two issues in particular. Uh, issue number one, um, it's actually quite surprising uh, in a water system how much static pressure you get when the, when the, when the taps are shut off. And usually um, a, a fitting would be designed to clamp the pipes together, hold them together. And with this design, there's no, there's no clamping force holding the pipes together. Um, the second problem is that there's, there's no seal. So water will leak out of the pipes. If we also look at the GI fittings, the situation is similar. Uh, they don't fit very tightly onto the pipe, they just push the pipes in and there's no seal. In fact, there is an internal thread on these fittings and they seem less effective than these, these more improvised, improvised connections. So the system worked, but it was fragile. These pipes run overground to a crowded living space. They get knocked and bumped and it really doesn't take much to loosen the connections. The consequences of this are not insignificant. If there are a few leaking pipes, this causes the pressure at the taps to decrease. The system is built to spec, but not to exceed spec. Well, not by a great amount. And when the pressure at the taps drop, the flow rate becomes quite unacceptable. To give you an idea, it should be at least 7.5 uh, liters per minute according to sphere standards. Um, when we measured it at this tap, uh, as you can see, using a very simple, uh, uh, simple bottle testing, how long it took to put, 
time it took to fill up the bottle. Um, it was it was actually about half a litre per minute. So it's it quite significantly less. And in the light of this limitation, people living in the camp became pretty resourceful. When their tap wasn't working, they would head up the slope, pull apart one of the weak fittings and use that as a tap instead. <laughs> one of the reasons for the poor connections, in fact. Um, they added their own pipes to the tank and ran them down to their houses. So here you've kind of got them all sort of connected into the other pipes. So also a couple, you know, they'd open the top of the tank and run them out of there as well. And all sorts of great ideas, GI fittings, spare pipe, plastic bags. And as you can see in this picture, there's even a couple of rocks being used to hold the pipes together. However, of course, this exacerbates the pressure problem. And I don't think anyone could claim this situation is really remotely safe or sanitary um, for anyone. So we get back to this situation. The thoughts on effective use and time in an emergency context are very valid. It's only really a, a reliable option to use an alternative if the alternative is known and quick and simple to achieve. And as seen here, um, some alternatives are a good temporary solution, but the concern that workarounds will not be as good as a properly designed solution, or even that they're safe, is also valid. Commercial pipe fittings do embody a little bit more knowledge and understanding than these quick fixes. So I think what we need is a way of getting something that's not too far off an engineered, an engineered design solution when we can't actually get one cost effectively. So now I'll tell you a different story of what we actually did. Um, so a little bit of background. The organization I work for, called Field Ready, is focused on tackling supply chain issues in the humanitarian sector using digital manufacturing technologies that can be applied as close to the area of need as possible. We work with a lot of different technologies, but in this case, the weapon of choice was a 3D printer. This is because when we traveled out to Sindhapal Truck District, which is the region of Nepal where this, where this camp was and where the epicenter of the earthquake was, um, we didn't know what supply chain problems we would come across, and a 3D printer is probably the most portable and versatile factory you can fit in the back of a Land Rover. On discovering that this camp was short of appropriate fittings, we designed a 3D printable version of a commercial plastic compression fitting. The next day, we sat our 3D printer on top of the Land Rover, hooked it up to a car battery, and printed. And voila, we have a pipe fitting. Isn't it great? Uh, this was printed actually last September. Um, we went back in December to check that it was still in the same condition, and perfect, nothing had changed. Now, I'm sure a few of you who own 3D printers are wondering about the technical details of how this works um, in terms of tackling porosity, selecting a slightly higher temperature than usual helps the layers bind better, and in terms of creating a seal, you can print a mold and cast the O-ring from silicone. But the important point is that once the part is designed, tested, and optimized, I can take a 3D printer, a real plastic, and a tube of silicone to any camp anywhere in the world and produce a part to a standard which is fit for purpose. So let's look at, um, look at our aid worker engineer uh, once more, at this time imagining he had a 3D printer and was, and was comfortable using it. So once the 3D part is designed, it takes 15 minutes max to set up a 3D printer, not long. Um, it may take a few hours to produce the part, but that's machine time. Our engineer can go ahead and do other things. They can even set up the water system with a temporary solution, knowing that it will be simple to replace the joints with the correct fitting before leaving site. They no longer have to feel worried that their solution will miss and be vital. The legwork has been done designing and testing the part somewhere else by someone else, and someone else will qualify it. So let's take a look at this more closely with a piece of work I have been doing recently out in Nepal. For me, one of the biggest sources of requests for 3D prints is hospitals. At the hospitals I visited, a lot of the more complex or sophisticated equipment is generally donated. We are talking items such as ECG machines, baby incubators, dental chairs. This is great until something breaks. Um, at which point we, we hit a bit of a problem. 
Um, spare parts are often hard to find. Some parts are not even available anymore because the, the equipment is quite old. Um, and replacing the equipment as a whole is generally quite expensive. So let's look at an example. Um, this is a nebulizer compressor. Um, a nebulizer is a standard piece of hospital equipment and is used to deliver medicine to patients. It works using a compressor to feed pressurized air through a device containing liquid medicine. This forces the medicine into a fine mist, which the patient then inhales. The engineering department at the hospital receive these devices several times a week as staff have snapped off the connection point for the tube, delivering compressed air to the nebulizer. The engineers usually just glue it back on, but unfortunately, this only lasts a couple of days before the compressor comes back to them once again broken. The engineers know what they want to fix it. They've designed it, um, a new part that can easily be screwed on. It's better supported at the point of connection so the hospital staff can't break it as easily. Of course, getting such a part is another matter. It doesn't exist on the market and can't be produced um, in the hospital's maintenance lab. Um, so they asked if Field Ready, I me, um, could help produce that part. So this is that same part printed by Field Ready in the pool. It's pretty nice with a lovely tenon thread printed with no support. Um, but what's especially great about this part is it wasn't actually designed by me or any other member of Field Ready in the pool. I sent the design sketches, key dimensions, material requirements to a chap called Raphael, a member of Humanitarian Makers. He's a pretty good guy. He works for the World Food Programme in London, has technical backgrounds in robotics, experience using CAD software, and a big interest in doing practical work for the humanitarian sector. He was happy to fill in the missing link for the engineers in the hospital and produce a CAD model of their design that they could print. So there you go, specified in Nepal, designed in London, and made back in Nepal again. And here is our working nebulizer. So I guess a few of you might be wondering at this point how far this concept of local digital manufacture can go. There's obviously a limit to the number of things we can 3D print. And in a lot of places, supply chains are pretty wide reaching and efficient. So let me share one more example of just how massive the opportunity is here, even when you can get something through a traditional supply chain. So this on your left of the screen is a height board, a device used to measure the height of children under five, which can also be laid horizontally to measure the length of babies. The measurement is used to check for malnutrition in children and is an integral part of most nutrition programs. Let's follow one on its journey to Nepal. So it starts off in the USA, where it is manufactured. It is then shipped to the UNICEF warehouse in Copenhagen, where you can purchase one for $82. It then gets put on a ship, with shipping costs approximated as an additional 15% of the purchase price, and gets sent to Nepal. By this time, it's taken around one and a half to three months. If you're lucky, it will end up in the Nepal warehouse within a week of arrival. But remember, in the aftermath of the earthquake, the airports in Kathmandu formed a bottleneck, and huge amounts of aid could not get through. Others experienced challenges with rapidly changing customs restrictions, finding that certain items were suddenly prohibited. And of course, we can't forget the blockade at the Nepal-India border. Once the hype board reached Nepal, it generally spends, spends another month or two traveling between various levels of local warehouse before finally ending up at the health post. By this time, local transport has added another 15 to 20% of the cost, plus damage in transit and storage accounts for further 10% loss of items. The height board arrives where it is needed 10 to 32 weeks after it is ordered at 50 to 100% of the original budget. Now this is a really well-known problem. UNICEF has, has tried really hard to work on it. And if you, if you look on their website, you can actually obtain drawings of this piece of equipment with the idea that local carpenters can make the boards um, locally. Um, but unfortunately, things aren't that simple. So the head of um, health and nutrition in the World Vision Response Office, um, which is where Field Ready are based in the poor, uh, recalls tackling this challenge whilst working on a nutrition program in Papua New Guinea. 
It was too costly to ship a small number of cords out from Copenhagen for her project, so she tried to use a local carpenter instead. However, there are a few subtleties to the design. Operation depends on accurate construction, with parts set at 90 degrees, and with the surface finish to fairly high quality. Most of the work the carpenter sees on a day-to-day -day basis does not require accurate angles or an understanding of tolerances, so he wasn't able to produce this item to the required standard. I mean, it's a measuring device. It has, you know, if you make three of them, they have to they have to measure the same on the same child, and that just didn't happen. And this is a remarkably common problem. It would be great to use local manufacturing to supply key items for many reasons, but the quality of the output simply isn't good enough. So what can we do? Well, there's a few different ways of looking at this problem. The, this item is an obvious candidate for CNC milling, for example. We could use a local makerspace in Kathmandu and CNC mill the boards. They would be accurate, manufactured to the right tolerance, and the results would be repeatable. Or we could redesign it to be 3D printable, for example, with a light plastic slider. Alternatively, we could manufacture much closer to the final communities and health posts using a 3D printer to make jigs to enable the local carpenters to manufacture the boards precisely. So I think it's quite an exciting concept. So the scope to have impact is huge, and in a surprising array of scenarios. So just to give you a, f a few more insights into what we're doing over here and the, the wide range of activities we're getting involved, involved with, um, here's some work we did working with local radio operators, helping them construct antennas more accurately with 3D printed custom parts. This, another example, this picture shows the workshop of a local wax caster. What happens here is they, they make a model out of wax, cover it in ceramic, uh, melt out the wax, fill it with molten metal, wait for it to cool, break away the mold, and you, you have a metal part. This is something quite exciting you can do with 3D printing. You can use a 3D print as the pattern for lost wax casting. And we're working with local craftsmen on 3D printed car parts. And it's not even all low volume items. I mean, just to, just to show the scale of it, we're working, working with local injection molding firms to make safe water containers in the core, just at the other end of it. So there really are a huge variety of ways digital manufacture can tackle key humanitarian supply chain problems. Utilizing the skills and capabilities of engineers such as yourselves means that we can take time to ensure digital designs are of a certain standard well before in, a, in an emergency context. And digital manufacturing means we can realize these designs to the same standard anywhere in the world. I guess the next key question is, can I really see hyperlocal digital manufacturing really becoming a viable option in age? It's very easy to theorize that one day this whole system will be slick enough and aid workers will feel comfortable producing a pipe fitting using a 3D printer out in the middle of the middle of the field, but you know, is this really going to happen? So Fortunately, the other day, I had an opportunity to prove my theory to myself. I was washing up my blender here in Nepal, and I broke the seal between the jug and the base. I couldn't believe I was in the situation again. I'm pretty busy here, to be honest. I often work 10 to 12 hour days, I'm traveling, I'm meeting people, I'm going out to the field, and to be frank, spending half my day fixing a blender is just, just unrealistic. So my options, well, there is no Amazon Prime here. There is, however, a supermarket 20 minutes walk away where I can buy a new blender for $30. There is also my 3D printer and a can of silicone in my lab. So one option, 40 minutes walk, 10 minutes shopping, so that's 50 minutes of my time, and $30 purchase cost, all the way I actually did it. I spent 15 minutes measuring and modeling a 3D printable mold. I spent five minutes, spent five minutes just setting up the print, 10 minutes, um, mixing up silicone uh, and pouring it into the mold. Um, and then that's in total, that's 30 minutes of my labor time, and then $7 of purchase cost, if you like, accounting for material, electricity, and depreciation of the 3D printer. And actually, so it turns out, my path of least resistance is actually making, which is Great news, I feel like a changed person. 
So to close, I truly believe that digital manufacture has the power to revolutionize the humanitarian supply chain. Whether it's enabling parts like pipe fittings to be produced in remote locations when traditional supply chains fail, or maintaining vital hospital equipment, or enabling local carpenters to take their making to the next level, I also think um, that the key to this is harnessing the power of people like you with the engineering skills to produce digital files of well-designed, tried and tested products, coupled, of course, with organizations like Field Ready, working deep in the field, identifying the needs and testing and prototyping with key users and stakeholders. If you agree with me, there are a number of ways you can act on this, of course. Quickest and easiest would be to check out our design challenges and then your skills in designing something for the Nepal response. Um, and you can do that at fieldready.org. And if you have any other ideas or questions or want to contribute in some other way, feel free to contact me at abby.fieldready.org. So thank you for your time, and I'll hand over to Naomi. All right. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, if you can just uh, advance the slide to um, Naomi's bio, that would be great, or one of you. So I want to introduce our next speaker, Naomi London who is curating and co-building humanitarian makers and its growing community. Her background is in business management with a focus on advancing the development of effective solutions to local and global challenges, especially those related to health and socioeconomic well-being. She has a tremendous amount of expertise spanning a variety of industries, uh, but has a common range of designing, implementing, and managing initiatives aimed at creating value for and with others. So I'm very excited to have Naomi join us today, and I will hand it over to her. All right, thank you, everyone. And just uh, taking off from where Abby left us, um, as you can see, there's uh, great examples of where the design and engineering um, expertise can come into play in these humanitarian situations. So today I'm going to be talking about um, just introducing basically humanitarian makers to you. Um, and we'll go quickly through um, like why humanitarian makers and what we believe, what we're doing, ways to engage now and in the future, what that might look like, and how to become a humanitarian maker. Um, so basically, humanitarian makers is bringing people together to shrink the aid supply chain. Um, just pulling from examples that Abby had shared with you previously, um, you can see that the people that we're bringing together um, are basically aid workers and humanitarians and connecting them with bakers, designers, engineers, supply chain experts, technologists, you know, other innovators uh, who want to work to help address this problem. Um, and the problem is high complexity and high cost along the supply chain. Um, and our hypothesis is that humanitarians plus makers can reduce this complexity and cost to increase the long-term well-being of those affected. So what do we believe? We believe appropriate disruptive technology plus a keen understanding of the real world problems does lead to breakthrough transformation and aid delivery. Appropriate disruptive technology. And we gave several, several examples of how uh, 3D printing um, and rapid manufacturing can help create effective solutions um, in the context of working directly with people who understand the problem um, and are living with that problem. What, what we are doing now, so Humanitarian Makers is, a, is, is new, it's um, developing, and what we're going through now is building trust and relationships with partners on the ground, with different stakeholders, with makers, with the community that has an interest in solving this problem. So there's a lot of listening and learning from each other. Uh, we're also engaging in pilots uh, and attempting to understand how we can work uh, together. This is all under the fundamental building block of bringing people together to shrink the supply chain. 
So Humanitarian Makers is building a channel for professionals to contribute to the humanitarian needs expressed on the ground. So ways to engage now. I mentioned pilot. Abby had uh, given examples on design challenges. These you can see on, on the Field Ready website. And we had undergone a pilot uh, early in the year to better understand how these designs can be communicated to the communities, uh, maker communities, humanitarian maker community, and get people around solving these problems in a way that uh, understands the context and has the right process uh, to get the design made in effective time. Another example of a pilot that we're engaging is disaster relief product catalog mapping. So what is this? Uh, basically disaster uh, relief organizations um, using their current process in their supply chains that they've established um, have have developed catalogs that list all of the products that they have available to for people in the field to order from in the case of emergencies or needs um, there on the ground. What we're trying to do is create a template or guide that can help makers and professionals around the world assess what products in these catalogs can be made uh, through rapid manufacturing or local manufacturing options. Um, the idea is to have members hold in-person meetup, meetup type groups um, to gather and assess and go through uh, this catalog and, and be able to highlight what is, what is needed to make uh, certain products, what type of materials, what type of machines. Um, and so that's just a brief uh, example of that type of pilot that we're engaging in now. The other way to engage is member discussion. So we're bringing makers, professionals, humanitarians together to shrink the aid supply chain. And a lot of that is, is yet to be learned. How can we do that by leveraging advanced appropriate technology um, and connecting with local, and under, local knowledge and understanding of what's happening on the ground? In the future, what does that look like? Ways to engage in the future. Um, we believe there will be opportunities to also have on-site hardware design, um, basically mobilizing makers um, in the community to go to the field and work directly with Field Ready or other organizations that have humanitarian needs. Uh, we also envision there may be working groups as different uh, challenges come up uh, to circle around those and figure out how to take action to make a difference in that area. Research, uh, we envision that there would be a need to understand who, what is working, what is not, what can be done better, what kind of materials uh, work effectively in different regions, different contexts, as well as cross-training and learning from each other. So creating a community that is diverse, that is, represents a lot of different scenarios and situations, and how can we leverage, or leverage that learning to other contexts. So that leaves us with how, how to become a humanitarian maker. Um, right now, the way to do it is to go to the website humanitarianmakers.net, which actually takes you to LinkedIn. And there you can join the, the community. Um, and then you start engaging in that discussion, receive news of what's happening, of uh, design challenges, um, as well as opportunities to engage in other projects as they come up. We also have a page on Facebook that you're welcome to, to take a look at and receive news on and engage in discussion there, or engage in conversation uh, with us at, on Twitter at Humanitarian Makers.
So thank you very much for your time. I think we'd love to hear from you and uh, understand the questions that you have for us. So I'll turn it back to Diana. Thank you so much. So uh, this, uh, this is an opportunity for all of our attendees to be able to ask their questions. So I invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A window, please. So uh, one question that's already come in is actually a request, a request of an example of what has been produced through the humanitarian maker group. And now I know that uh, Naomi um, and uh, Abby both shared uh, just initial ideas, but perhaps you can give us a couple of uh, direct examples of uh, parts or uh, systems that have been um, fixed uh, that have been repaired with uh, your group work. Sure. Um, so, as in the, the presentation, we saw an example of Raphael who who'd fixed a nebulizer for hospital. And actually, most of the work so far has been on has been on hospital parts. Um, mm -hmm. So there was an example of uh, a rubber box, um, which you it basically okay. I'll start from the beginning. That wasn't a very good answer. Um, there's a hospital in one of the districts in Nepal, which is basically destroyed by the earthquake. And um, it's running all of its services out of tents. And one of uh, the tents was basically easy. to get power to a tent, you need a, a rubber box where you take in the mains power, plug it into this unit, and then it, it gives power to a bunch of plug sockets which you can plug your equipment into. Um, and at the hospital, they were going to throw this. Um, it was a donated piece of equipment. They couldn't replace it, didn't have the funds, didn't actually have it available to buy another one. And the reason it was broken was simply the plastic connector on top where you attach the mains, the mains lead into the unit. It wasn't anything complicated at all, but it was kind of fatal to them being able to use it. So um, I actually did a lot of the measurements um, and sent it to a humanitarian maker and she modeled the part and sent it back to me, printed it, and now they have a, a working unit in the hospital, which is really exciting. So that's, that's another example. So that's a fantastic example. And um, Naomi, could you speak a little bit to how the humanitarian network uh, was a part, uh, humanitarian makers network was a part of that, or how how do you interface with Field Ready um, in Nepal? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I want to say that it's pretty nascent right now, so we are small in, in figuring things out. And so the mm -hmm. how we've been doing it is. Um, basically broadcasting through social media, uh, talking with Field Ready, understanding what the design challenges are, and then taking that and, and sharing it with the, the community um, and pulling people together to say, this is, this is how you can get in on the design challenge. And so we're trying to still figure that out and work out kinks, um, but that's the process that we've used to date. Right, so the community aspect. So um, a great follow-up question and one that I was also um, thinking is uh, regarding uh, just uh, the, the costs associated with having 3D printers in the field. So the question came up of how, what is the initial cost of having a 3D printer in a disaster setting? And um, furthermore, associated with that, how flexible are you with um, the being able to deliver parts or deliver solutions when there are limitations on materials that you're able to use as, as, a, as a local manufacturing group and uh, the size of parts that can be printed or, or built? So um, that's a pretty expansive question, but uh, maybe uh, you could speak to some of that. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a question I get a, I get a lot, um, and the answer is perhaps you know it's it's not as it's not as straightforward as you think. So I guess I will start from the beginning. So buying a three D printer costs about a thousand dollars. You know, it's not it's not the cheapest piece of equipment, but it's also not the most expensive piece of equipment. Um, and I mean, what, I think what the real question is in terms of how much is the initial cost for having a 3D printer in a disaster region is really, is it more cost effective than shipping the same parts out from, you know, one of the warehouses in Europe or the USA or wherever else there, there might be a central warehouse? I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of the key question. It doesn't matter how much it actually costs. Um, so we actually have a, a great case study from a while back on um, umbilical cord clamps 
and I, I think this should it should explain the answer the answer quite well. So imagine you've got uh, a factory, say in China, making millions and millions of clamp, these clamps, which are, is a, a small piece of hospital equipment. They cost pennies or cents. Um, they're not very expensive at all if you went and bought them in China where they're, where they're produced. However, there was a situation in Haiti um, where one of the hospitals needed about 30 a month. Haiti is a long way from China. That sounds like a really stupid statement, but it's kind of kind of the crux of the matter. So to get umbilical cord clamps, which should cost a couple of cents to Haiti, and you need 30 of them, you don't need a million, you need 30. Um, that's actually not really economically viable. You have to buy millions of the things, stick them in a container, and ship them all the way to Haiti. That's extremely expensive. It's actually it's unaffordable. They were asking volunteers to bring them in their suitcases from, from, from the U.S. Right. Now, a 3D printer, which we, we shipped out, um, we, uh, we, we, had running, we had running in one of the local make spaces in Haiti, and we produced the, the parts there. Um, basically, the shipping, having a 3D printer, as in paying $1,000 and then accounting for the fact that you're going to be making quite a lot of parts, with this, with this one device, the material cost, the electricity, the labor, it basically came out at a couple of dollars per clamp. Now, yes, mm. this is more expensive than buying a couple of clamps for, for cents in China, but it's a lot cheaper than shipping a, a container load of umbilical cord clamps you don't need to Haiti. So it's, mm. it's a relative thing, and it's something, something unique to a 3D printer. A 3D printer is best when you're producing a, a low volume of bespoke parts, and that's where it becomes like economically advantageous. Um, we're not saying you should be producing millions of umbilical cord clamps with a 3D printer. That's obviously not a good idea. Um, right. And then how flexible are they since they have limitations on the materials to use and on the size of the parts printed? Yeah, great question. So your typical consumer 3D printer prints basically two kinds of plastic, ABS and PLA, um, and the size of the parts is limited by the size of the bed. So the biggest one we've got here is uh, about 10 inches square, so you can, you can make an object about that size, um, which doesn't sound like a lot. But um, as I hope I was demonstrating through, through a few of the examples, you know, the best way to use um, a 3D printer is, is not always just through producing straight up parts. Um, so a couple of the ways we're using them here is one to make jigs, to make uh, bigger uh, objects, um, so larger objects like the height board, which you need a certain degree of accuracy for, and you couldn't make here really otherwise. We're making jigs to make that possible, which is a really great use of 3D printing and allows you to make much bigger parts with different materials such as wood, um, and also facilitate local manufacturers, which is even better. And another example is using them to make patterns and molds. So uh, in, in the presentation, for example, the example of making a mold, which you then make a, um, a, a silicone seal or an O-ring, for example, you can make an O-ring using that method. And then the other example of working with local metal casters, which is another really exciting example, uh, where you're using a 3D printer to produce, say, um, a pattern. So you could produce a, a car part with a really terrible, you know, a, pl a plastic material that's not going to be suitable for a car part, and then use that as a pattern in a casting process, and then at the end of it, you can get a metal part out. So, you know, yes, a 3D printer is a closed system. There's there's limitations on the material, but it's it's a really brilliant piece of kit when you can can kind of work out more interesting ways to use it in particular way, particularly ways you can fit in with the local making and manufacturing landscape. You're basically, you accelerate it, you can get so much more out of it, which is, which is really exciting for aid context and development context as well. I hope that answers the question. I think that was quite thorough and I think it definitely highlights um, the viability, especially when we're talking about factoring in the, the time associated with waiting for even the delivery of thousands of parts from China, even if they're cheaper, there's that cost associated with trying to, uh, in the interim, have, uh, you know, individuals with suitcases coming to location to bring those consumables. And 
On that note, uh, I do really want to, I know the question was about the initial cost of, of the 3D printer, but uh, it would be great if you could speak to the operating costs associated and also just operating factors for uh, 3D printers and local manufacturing. So um, I love the fact that you provided that uh, description of the interface between where, local, uh, where the 3D printer, for example, enables uh, local manufacturing in the form of casting or more traditional methods. But uh, um, with 3D printing, um, and especially with the consumables required, the electricity requirements, how are those requirements factored into uh, the, the challenges associated with disaster relief where infrastructure is compromised? Yeah, so I guess the, the situation is different everywhere. Um, here in Nepal, um, what I'm operating on at the moment um, the kind of standard costs that are, are, are around in every scenario, you've got the original cost of the machine to depreciation, you've right. got the electricity cost of running it, um, so factored in the cost of um, electricity here, or if you're out in the field, you'd be running it off of the solar panels and the cost of actually see if factor that in, and then the material costs as well. Um, the, so that's kind of your basic costs. And if you're running a 3D printer, that basically works out at a little under uh, $4 per hour. So depreciation, electricity, material. Oh, and I forgot, I did actually include success rates. So obviously you're going to have some prints um, where right. perhaps there's been right. like a, a design error or uh, somebody switches it off midway through running. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there will be a certain, <laughs> uh, certain cost associated with that as well. So your basic rate is about for you know four dollars per hour and in terms of transport and where you're going with your 3d printer that that does obviously depend a lot on where you're going and who's going um so at the moment i guess when it's just me i'm kind of, i'm pretty much going on along with um standard visits from aid agencies anyway so it's actually not any additional cost to what aid agencies are, what aid agencies are already doing um yeah. so I guess I guess that's my answer. Four four dollars an hour is probably the best the best answer I can give you because that's going to be the, the same everywhere plus plus transport. Um, yeah, yeah. That's that's great. Great. So um, I'm going to swing over a little bit to Naomi here, and uh, you mentioned as uh, um, the humanitarian makers work, the pilots include uh, disaster relief product catalog mapping. So uh, relative to that. Uh, one of the things that Abby mentioned is that uh, they were able to print products to a, a specific standard uh, to enable them to interface with, with these uh, medical systems or, or the water distribution systems. So um, if humanitarian makers, in addition to cataloging these products, cataloging the standards associated with those products and all of the information that enables effective printing or local manufacture of these parts, Um, thank you. Can you say again what your question is? So the question is, in terms of the humanitarian makers' cataloging efforts, uh, you noted that the pilot included disaster relief product cataloging, um, so or product catalog mapping. Is there anything that's capturing the standards that the parts have to be printed to or relevant standards associated with these consumables or products for for the field for disaster relief? Is, is humanitarian makers engaging also in cataloging any of that? Okay, so a standards question. Uh, thank you for repeating that. Um, so I should first uh, like just clarify that humanitarian makers is, is not an organization in itself. It is a community um, made up of its members. Um, and so as, as we grow, we'll be able to uh, work together to, you know, figure out what needs to be done and, and who's going to work on it um, and, and move these things forward. And discussions has been uh, um, understood that, yes, standards are important, quality is important, um, and that is something that we would like to, to see included. Um, I think, you know, in the long term, the vision is to have a, a, you know, an open access um, type platform where people can go in and, and find these designs that have already been um, tried and tested in the field and designed in these contexts and be able to continually develop them and understand, you know, what are the standards, what is, you know, what is the, um, the performance and the quality um, and have, have that information available and continue building upon it. 
That's a fantastic idea. We'd love to help you out with that here at E4C. So uh, thank you so much for that answer. I, I guess I'm, I have a question for both of you, um, unless there's additional questions from the audience that anybody wants to throw out there. But uh, what do you feel, um, relative to your experience to date, what do you feel are the other enablers that, that are necessary to, to really help to expedite and um, really drive the work of, of the humanitarian making movement? Maybe, think, maybe things that are already happening or things that could be happening that really would help help out the cause? That's a great question. Um, I guess one of the barriers I'm coming across most in the A, a community is just this assumption that, um, I guess, uh, that manufacturing is very, very complicated. And I'm really hopeful that, you know, humanitarian makers bringing the maker community a lot closer to the humanitarian community will begin to give people a bit more a bit more confidence um, and um, less concern and less worry and less fear of of different technologies such as 3D printing. Like something I get over and over again is, oh I'm not a technologist, I can't possibly do it. And it's basically like it's it's no more complicated than using a than using the printer in the office or a computer or a smartphone. And I'm really excited that I guess Communities coming together in future. Fantastic. And Naomi, did you have any any thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. And so I guess um, it's a it's a challenge to us is to um, to have the discussions and and you know bring and 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 find ways to collaborate with various experts or partners that are tackling um, these different. Um, aspects of you know, all the pieces that can make um, this connection work. Um, so I would say is having those conversations and uh, finding the right partners and, and creating a sense of collaboration um, that we can, that the pie is big enough that if everyone, if we work together, we can really make um, disruptive and significant change to how the aid supply chain currently operates. I think personally that that's an incredibly noble mission. and. Uh, so far, I think you guys are very much on the right track, and we really are grateful for you taking the time to join us from literally halfway across the world here from New York City in Nepal um, and uh, sharing some of the amazing innovation and, and some of the progress that you've been able to make on the ground. So with that, we are – oh, we have another question we see. Uh, uh, there's apparently a question that – um, is not visible to me. It might have been asked privately. Uh, Abby, if you're seeing that question, do you, would you like to address it? Oh. Um, so you mentioned that there's a question that we haven't perhaps answered. I, I am not seeing any questions that we've missed. Um, oh, if any. Should I, should I read it out? Have we got go time? For it. Yeah, go for it. It might have been asked privately. I may just not be able to see it in the, in the Q&A. Yeah, no worries. So there was one which is from Gary Jones who said, you didn't mention local training to get local people into the design and manufacturing realm themselves. How about this approach? Um, oh. We haven't asked that, have we? So, um, yeah. Should I cover that one off quickly? Yeah, please, go for it. We have a minute left, yeah. so you're welcome to. I thought, I thought it was a great question. Um, so I guess there's, there's a few levels to my response. First one is the field ready. I guess the main focus is on on training aid, aid workers because we're uh, you know an emergency response focused organisation. But I think a really really big part of that is training local makers because they're going to be the first responders. Um, so there's two sections to that. One is in terms of the manufacturing, and one's in terms of the 3D design CAD design. Um, so 3D printing is definitely one we're 100% full steam ahead on. Uh, I think the really important thing. With, the, with getting people into technologies such as 3D printing, CNC milling, uh, and various other digital manufacturing technologies, is basically to fit it into the, the, the local making landscape already. Because um, I think it's, it's, it's a lot easier to get people to respond to that rather than plonking a weird technology in the middle and going, yes, imagine crazy uses of this. It's not very helpful. So two of the ways we're doing that is we're working with local radio um, amateur amateur radio enthusiasts who are really great makers. They're making antennas and radios 
um, often about all the time, and 3D printing is a great way of helping them make um, their antennas a lot more accurately, because that's one of the things that's a really big problem over here. It's quite difficult to construct things to that level of accuracy, and antennas have to be pretty pretty bang on. So we're, we're working with them to design design custom parts for that. And another community we're, we're trying to link up with is the casting community. So using um, basically setting up a jewelry making, uh, 3D printing to jewelry making uh, training course over here as well, which I think is really exciting because jewelry making is a very exciting cultural, cultural part of Nepal, which is very exciting. On the other side of it, on the computer-aided design, I think this is actually a harder and longer process. Um, lots of people are really keen and ready to get into 3D printing, but there's a lot more nervousness around 3D design. So at the moment, we're focusing on interns, so engineering students who are already experienced in that, in that a little bit. So I've, I've had an intern in the office, and we've been working together on a few different projects. Um, but I really think probably um, you know, that one's going to be a bit more of a longer longer process. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And sorry for adding an extra question at the end, Iona. No, no, it's totally fine. We're actually perfectly on time. We, we are at time right now. And I think that was a very worthwhile question for us to uh, actually um, answer. And I, I, I couldn't see it, but I'm very glad that you caught it. So uh, with that, I, I'd like to thank uh, Naomi and Abby for taking the time to join us today. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for tuning in. Uh, we will have a recording of this webinar available within a few days. And for those of you who are seeking uh, professional development hours, the code is listed. Please submit via the instructions on the professional development page. And if we haven't answered your question, feel free to email us on the address that you see listed on the slide. And we invite you, of course, to become E4C webinars so that you can get information about upcoming webinars directly in your inbox. Thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. And we will catch you on the next E4C webinar. Bye-bye.